you've stepped into Nightland, the nation in a constant state of war. Many things to look forward to from such a place. It surely wouldn't be boring. Although what they are warring against is what brings some complexities. The story begins with Kachina, a young warrior from the Children of Echoes, one of Natland's six tribes specializing in mining and excavation. Kachina comes as the self doubting type, downplaying her own capacities but still being full of ambition and resolve. But, most of all, kindness. Despite having her teammates give up on her, she made sure that they didn't feel bad about it. We come to understand that she is her tribe's chosen one, as she bears the ancient name Uthabiti, but in true Kachina fashion, she does not understand why her, of all people, was given the name which embodies resilience. On the topic of the ancient names, I will explain quickly what they are. They are a way to record the past in that land. These names belong to past heroes of the land who existed 500 years ago, so each tribe has their own name bearer, and name bearers are chosen by the Wyob. And, in turn, each name has a meaning, while all of them have a purpose not yet revealed. The names themselves don't grant any powers, but they're a mark of recognition of an individual's potential. Despite her heritage, Kachina wishes to follow you and observe you, setting aside her need to look for extra teammates for the pilgrimage before the deadline. As according to her, nobody ever expects anything out of her as she loses all the time, and that she is used to it. Kachina shows us to the Wayab of her tribe, and there the Wayab is described to us as interconnection and communication points between the real world and the Night Kingdom, a plane that exists between the one of the living and the departed, which is where they extract ancient names from, to give it to the chosen of each tribe. The Wayab has sentience, as it is a congregation of all the greatest souls of a tribe. Kachina then shows us her ancient name, written on an obsidian stone. Translating the runes on it, it says NTBT, which is not of any relevance or even meaning that I know of. Coming out of the tribe's village and attuning yourself to the statue of the Seven of Natlan, a notice is made that it feels somewhat wrong, as if empty and completely prevents you from obtaining the powers of Pyro. Kachina casually explains to us that the nation of Natlan has been home to countless of Pyro Archons, which are not gods, as every human who succeeds in the pilgrimage and the Night Warden's War may become the next Pyro Archon. But, oddly enough, each of these Archons still age and require rest like any other human. In truth, it does not mean everything, as a human can have longevity similar to that of a god if they receive a curse which are easily created, the best examples being Dainsleaf and Furina, one being an extraordinary knight leader of Kenria, but still a human by definition, and the other being the simplest and most unimpressive girl. Yet, they are both living for centuries now because of their curses, with all that, it very much sounds like Natalan does not have a real Pyro Archon, and is instead enacting a one-for-all concept, passing along a power down the line and creating many Archons. But, in the process, damaging the divine essence of Pyro itself, making it too weak for the Statue of the Seven to attune you with it. Kachina explains more, telling us that the pilgrimage is a way to select each new Pyro Archon, and that she maintains her ambition to keep going through the pilgrimage in order to join the Night Warden's War, and invites us to go to where it actually takes place. Convenient enough, as the Pyro Archon shows up there. The pilgrimage itself also holds another specific purpose, however it is not made clear yet. With that done, you're allowed a leisure dino ride to the Stadium of the Sacred Flame, which is where all the competition happens, and could be considered Natland's main city as an outsider, although they don't really have one in truth, the stadium being more of a lobby, a meetup point for all tribes. At the entrance of the stadium, 
you came to encounter Kachina's friends, introducing you directly to Kinich, part of the Scions of the Canopy, and Muolani, part of the people of the Springs, both of them being name bearers of their specific tribes. Further in, I suggest to everyone to switch their game to Japanese whenever Kinich and Ajal show up, as it will give you the opportunity to hear the voices of Sasuke and Naruto in Genshin, which is something of all time. いや、こいつリュウナのか? The group explains that name bearers are allowed to come back from the dead through the Ode of Resurrection, were they to be slain in these wars against the Abyss, making them sound casual about passing and calling it the blessing of the Archon. To me, such attitude makes it clear that something is bound to happen with a resurrection not taking place as they are all too sure that they would be brought back. This is where the truth of the nation in a constant state of war that describes Natlan is made clear, as the victors of the pilgrimage will then go wage war against the Abyss, which is in a constant offense towards Natlan. The Ode of Resurrection is not absolute, however, as the warriors may be revived only if the battle against the Abyss is deemed a victory. If not, their soul will be lost, and the ancient name given to them will be destroyed, preventing it from being inherited ever again. Back to the pilgrimage, as Kachina is alone in this setup, Muavani passes her team onto Kinich and tags with Kachina. It's afterwards explained that the pilgrimage's secondary purpose is to also collect contending fire from the battles that happened in its period a sort of fighting spirit which serves as fuel for the sacred flame of Nutlan, shielding the land from invasions of the Abyss. Afterwards, in a feast before the pilgrimage begins, it's established that Kachina is massive loose streaking her ranked grind as she's unable to prevail in a single pilgrimage, which is what would allow her to participate in the Night Warden's War. With her new teammate, Kachina stands her best chance as Muolani is already a veteran of the Night Warden's War, having participated in it three times and never fell in combat. There is only one thing that can explain her strength. Ikea Blue High The competition begins and the goals are established. Each team must search for fire towers and accumulate its contending fire by battling in its proximity, then bring it back to the stadium. The outcome of this trial will then select the participants who will fight one-on-one -on -one up until the final selection of victors. The competition rages on. Kachina and Mualani's team manage to gather enough contending fire and qualify for the one-on-one -on -one matches. A duo of sore losers gang up on Kachina, claiming she got the best of them through deception and trickery and demand a rematch though they quickly back down once you interject in their feud, or rather bullying of Kachina. We follow Kachina's progress, stealing her resolve with every passing encounter and proving her abilities to herself and everyone watching her, up until her fated fight against Muolani, which is a surprising tie, and eventually, Kachina gets the better of her friend, making sure to apologize in true samurai fashion before sending her flying. Kachina is now one of the victors of the pilgrimage, celebrating her first victory and breaking her lose streak. Without wasting any time, all the victors are announced before being sent to the Night Warden's War. We have Chaska on her sixth consecutive victory, member of the Flower Feather Clan, In Sun, part of the Collective of Plenty, Keolani, part of Mualani's tribe, the people of the springs, Kibangu, 
member of Kinetris Clan, the Science of the Canopy, and, of course, Kachina, name bearer of the Children of Echoes. Just like that, without any goodbyes, Kachina is going to fight in the war. In the meantime, Mualani invites you to her tribe, known for its hot springs that even the Pyro Archon enjoys. There, you meet Etia, one of the heroical figures of the modern Nathlan, now acting like the vigilante of the hot springs. A notice is made on Etia's scar nearing her stomach, as it is revealed that she was impaled by an entity from the abyss. Since Etia is not a name bearer, they couldn't let her die to bring her back unscathed. So, instead, they managed to save her, but despite the wound closing, the corrosion of the abyss is still eating her from within. Unfortunately, the person who loves the hot springs the most is now unable to go into them, as it deteriorates her condition. However, it appears that she has been secretly training her resilience to it, as she was spotted going to a hidden hot spring at night. In reaction to this, a few members of the tribe decided to organize a surprise accommodation of the hot spring, as well as a party for her. Being allowed some leisure time, you put on an outfit picked by Mualani for you, and dip into the hot springs, giving us a great view of how nice Ether, I don't know about Lumine, would look if he had an actual ponytail. While Paimon is rocking twin tails, that look like she has an additional jungle of a scalp behind her usual hair. Going to end the day, you are awoken in the night by the sound of battle, as the Abyss is leading an assault on the village. It's explained there that the Abyss is able to breach the places of Natlan through what is referred to as pylons. They seem to be specific to this region, as Natlan is known for having very weak ley lines it may allow the abyss to more easily invade the lands, with only the sacred flame acting as a shield, making the pilgrimage which fuels it a ritual to keep the land safe. In the battle, a Tia helped, which worsened her condition and caused the corrosion to eat at her being at an accelerated speed. Seeing her last moments, you woke up to her and do what you did back in Mondstadt with Valen's tear, purifying her body out of the corrosion of the abyss. But, unfortunately, the damage that was done was not healed, making her only better for the time being. Etia now knows her time is reaching its end, but is glad that she was able to witness this last party. She tells her goodbye to Moalani, her pride, and passes on to you a relic to give to the Pyro Orcon, implying that she would immediately know what this relic is for. Two days later, the news of the Night Warden's War reach out to you and Mualani. It is unfortunately told that Kachina lost her life in the battle. Without leaving time for shock, it is told that her team was victorious, so, as per the rules of the Ode of Resurrection, she will be revived. All too convenient, I say. As a little interlude following the Abyss's invasion, Moalani confirms that there are signs of intelligence, as when they invaded the world during the Cataclysm 500 years ago, their attacks were tailored to affect each tribe the most, such as water pollution for the people of the springs, the ground rupturing with a sludge from the Children of Echoes, Black winds blowing and cleaving the lands of the Flower Feather Clan, establishing that the Abyss is aware of what it goes up against. It is now believed that the Abyss has managed to invade the Night Kingdom, which is the place for the Wayob to communicate with and where the souls of the deceased linger for a while, allowing them to be brought back through the Ode of Resurrection. Speaking of which, you make your way to the stadium with Mualani, as the ode is about to be sung to bring back the victors of the Night Warden's War, in a beautiful chorus of tribal chanting, wishing for the return of its heroes, a problem quickly appears. Kachina was not revived, 
as Mahuika did not find her within the Night Kingdom. The two obnoxious sore losers who bullied Kachina make sure to speak up, claiming that this victory over the Abyss is counterfeit, or that Kachina did not contribute at all in the war, having cowered away from the fight, excluding herself from the team, making her impossible to bring back in this manner. Naturally, all of this is nothing more than slander, as they quickly resume their silence, when Mahuika directly invites them to take up their claims with her. Mualani does speak up directly to the Archon, wishing to do anything in her power to rescue Kachina if possible, causing Mahuika to invite her and the rest of the party to her chambers. Here, she elaborates on the fact that the Abyss has found new ways to undermine the rules of Natlan, and that the pilgrimage will be put on hold, as this may result in more casualties with more people not being able to be revived. This is double-edged, however, as the pilgrimage fuels the Sacred Flame, which, in turn, shields Natalan to the best of its ability against the Abyss. Putting an end to the pilgrimage would cause the flame to grow weaker. It is made known here that Kenich's ancient name is Malipo, meaning Turnfire, which can be otherwise referred to as Responsibility. The odds are made clear now. The Night Kingdom is a place similar to the Ley Lines themselves. A person may linger there and it won't have any undesirable effect on their soul, but with the Abyss, it corrodes the soul of whoever touches the place, akin to erosion. It will eat up one's sanity and sense of self until the soul is rejoined with the Sea of Souls, otherwise known as the Primordial Sea. If you are still unfamiliar with what the Primordial Sea is, I'm working on a long format video about Fontaine's more obscure lore, but I've already released a part of it and that elaborates on what the Primordial Sea is, as well as other things, so I encourage you to go check it out. Going into the Night Kingdom is the current objective, to directly fetch Kachina from there. Although the risk of corruption is present, it is difficult to go there as a corporeal being in the first place. Kachina's ancient name needs to be found, first of all, prompting you to head to the Science of the Canopy to recover an artifact crafted by Sitlali called the Spirit Speaker Stone, allowing communication with the Night Kingdom. Before departing, Mualani gives a Tia's talisman to Mahuika, who recognizes its value and stashes it. With the main cast now gone, Mahuika reveals to the perceptive Kinich that putting a hold on the pilgrimage wasn't for the reasons she gave prior, but because the land is running low on pyro energy, making the pilgrimage a lost cause. As Natlan is at a breaking point, and everything needs to be focused on its defense, Mahuika indicates that the sacred flame must never go out, no matter what sacrificing her own energy to fuel the sacred flame until the matter is sorted. With not much time to feel bad about her sacrifice, the Fatui show up, and none other than El Capitano himself appears in front of Mahuika. The Archon of Natlan. A force to be reckoned with. He appears to know about the secret of the Ley Lines, possibly referring to the Night Kingdom, which are tied to it. He also mentions an oath made 500 years ago, which is currently unfulfilled. As Mahuika says herself, it sounds like this is about more than the Tsaritsa. It does appear like this is a matter of personal interest to Capitano, being aware of things that no one else other than Mahuika and the heroes of the past, the ancient names, knew. Perhaps this implies that Capitano is a native of Natlan, if not the bearer of an ancient name himself, or another thing I will come to talk about a bit later. After all, the Fatui's means to glean information are unparalleled, so it could be something else altogether. If we assume that Capitano is indeed the Bloodstained Knight from Mondstadt, a character self-absorbed by his own meaning of justice, who lost his humanity fighting countless monsters, causing him to wear a mask in order to hide his disfigured face, 
and mark the gods as enemies after seeing what has been done to Karenria, and by extension, the Abyss, as an injustice. Capitano mentions that her plan is now obsolete, and that it is up to him to create new rules for Nathan at the dawn of a new age. This can mean many things, as Nathan's rules have been established ever since the first Pyro Archon, Shpalanke, who mastered fire before the Sevens were established, and the Sage of the Stolen Flame gifted the Phlogiston to humanity. These times were so ancient that we even find the name of one of Shpalanke's enemies, Shukaro, an extremely powerful dragon who possibly was the Pyro Sovereign as they passed in the heart of the volcano. Ever since this age, the fire of the nation has been burning endlessly, possibly unnaturally, considering what needs to be done to fuel the sacred flame. After all, a fire is not meant to burn forever, as it exhausts vital resources for its own sustainability. I have my own personal theory on this, that I will elaborate on at the end of this video when Capitano mentions a few extra pieces of the puzzle as to why he may be a Nathlan and how he knows so much. After a difficult fight for both parties, or so it seems, as Capitano didn't seem to use any sort of delusion, unless he has no vision and Cryo is his delusion, he leaves the battlefield after sustaining a blow from Mahuika, who recognizes the work of the Nightwind tribe who assisted his retreat, mentioning she felt a strange presence within Capitano. After this encounter, Mahuika executes her plan and sacrifices her strength to the sacred flame. Having made your way to the science of the canopy, you obtain the Spirit Speaker Stone and make your way to Vichama, an old companion of Aetia, whose name is also quite notorious, to ask him to operate the stone for you. After obtaining Kachina's ancient name, Vichama wishes to recover the one of his former companion, Marco, but fails to do so and forces Chaska to destroy the stone to avoid further damage. With Kachina's ancient name in hand, you return to Mahuika in order to track her down in the Night Kingdom. Entering Mahuika's lodge, you are able to see many relics stashed here as treasure, including the talisman of Aetia and something as simple as Mahuika's family picture, showing her father, little sister, mother, and their two adopted Saurian. Moving on, the right to call to Kachina begins, and thanks to her ancient name, it works without a fault. Kachina, now able to communicate with the group, confirms what was feared. The Abyss found a way to affect the Wayob from within the Night Kingdom, causing, let's say, communication issues between it and the land of the living. In true Kachina fashion, she indicates that there is no need for you all to worry about her and do anything for her sake, and that she can be left there. The communication with her is cut short, but you are not able to enter the Night Kingdom to look for her, with Mahuika warning you that with her powers gone, she will not be able to offer a lot of support. Making your way to the rift opening a way to the Night Kingdom, you walk through all the ruins of the Old Dragon Civilization, part of the Age of the Seven Sovereigns. Then you enter the rift to the Night Kingdom. Here, you are greeted by the spirit of Marco, who was awakened by Vichama's calls, who offers you protection and guidance through the place, indicating that Kachina has been chased by an entity from the Abyss. Marco guides you through the whispers and the anguished souls, and you finally find Kachina. After your reunion, Marco runs out of time and takes his leave, after having provided you with what you needed, deciding to try and hold back whatever it is that chased Kachina. You decide to address the issue at hand and directly find a way up to cleanse its corruption from the abyss. And the chasing entity reveals itself afterwards to be Komonkui, the Abyss Lector of the Scorching Stars, who dispatched Malko. After a short dialogue with the Lector from Moolani, making the usual power of friendship dialogue, with a bit more significance to it than in your average shonen, both her and Kachina fight the Lector together. 
the confrontation ending in a victory for the duo, Mualani's ancient name begins glowing in approval, as a reflection of the original hero bearing the ancient name Umoja, meaning unity, shows itself. Tupac, built like a mountain, the giant warrior of the people of the springs who fought off the abyss 500 years ago, from this bond forged anew, Mualani recovers all the memories tied to this name, shedding light on the meaning of ancient names being a way to record the past. Mualani now reveals that the plan that Capitano himself spoke of 500 years ago, the people in that land saw the future struggle of the nation and a plan was set in motion. Insan interjects, saying this is not the right place to reveal it all, showing to us that Insan also bears an ancient name with a full bond to it, being aware of the prior 500 years. Restoring the way up before leaving, its voice can be heard again. It is titled as the Agent of Night's Will, giving voice to the Night Kingdom, feeling rather similar to the two fingers in Elden Ring, Agents of the Greater Will, both serving a fairly similar purpose. Prompting you to your exit, a collapse begins to happen and your way out of the Night Kingdom closes off as the rift you came through disappears. However, in her last endeavor, Mahuika opens the way and shatters the rift open, transforming it more into a chasm at this point. Insan explains that this was a projection of her consciousness, dawn from her chambers. You then quickly move on to return there, to also get a checkup on your situation from being exposed to the abyss. The first notice made is that all the belongings Mahuika had are now gone, and, in turn, the party state after the exposure to the abyss is of no dire consequences. Interestingly enough, you, as the traveler, are unaffected by the abyss. But so is Paimon, as usual, casually showing us that her alignment with Teyvat is not ordinary. Mahuika explains the rest of the situation. Natlan is kind of like all other nations as you arrive, on the verge of destruction, deeming that there is less than a year for the land to remain as the consequences of the cataclysm of 500 years ago. Once again, Natlan's ley lines being very scarce, it never truly recovered from this event. The only people who were made aware of this fact were the ancient heroes who passed along their legacy as their ancient names. Following this, Mahuika admits to the fact that she was the Pyro Archon from 500 years ago, which is contradictory with the Pyro Archons being regular humans who have normal lifespans. She makes the interesting statement to say that human life is like a flame, destined to be extinguished. Yet, this is not allowed upon the sacred flame, as its lifespan is being endlessly renewed by external means and sacrifices. If you're a fan of Dark Souls, you may see where I'm getting at with this, and I'll elaborate on it soon with Capitano's motive. Mahuika had prolonged her life by placing it within the sacred flame 500 years ago, prematurely ending her life before her own flame went out, giving a chance to wake up again one day, as she did. The Pyro Archons who succeeded Mahuika were to rebuild the decimated tribes by reuniting them and strengthening them, the Wayob of each tribe would also recover, and in time, name a hero for its tribe, indicating that said tribe was ready for war once more. The selected heroes were supposed to immediately know of this 500 years old plan as soon as they received their ancient name, but because of the Night Kingdom deteriorating, the Sacred Flame and the Wayob's communication became obstructed similar to the Ode of Resurrection not bringing Kachina back earlier. These heroes, who recover the memories of the ancient names, are to stand beside Mahuika to see this plan to its end. As of now, four heroes have awakened the memories of their ancient name. Kironen of the Children of Echoes, the same tribe as Kachina, Kinich, Insan, Mualani, which leaves two names missing, most likely Sitlari and Ororon, although they are both part of the same tribe. Mahuika now addresses the items missing from her room, 
indicating that these relics effectively functioned as fuel, as they have belonged to heroes or people of immense resolve. They have accumulated contending fire, the same way the pilgrimage does when people fight. This allowed her to keep a hand on an external reserve of energy, for a moment of need such as what happened. As we can notice, Mahuika even lost her family picture, as her desk is now entirely empty. Once everyone left her lodge, she reflects on her inner state and recalls her past companions and her family's words, who were rallied to her purpose for the future of Natlan, parting ways with them once again. A voice of the past asks Mahuika who will bring this cycle to an end. The voice seems masculine and feels ancient, even. Perhaps it is the voice of Shbalanke, the first Pyro Archon who chose Mahuika as his inheritor 500 years ago, if not more, before her sacrifice to the fire. Meeting up with her a bit later, Mahuika wishes to rally you to Natlan's cause, promising to even forge an ancient name for your feet to be remembered, adding to the long list of titles and honorifics the Traveler received. It also means that you may die and be resurrected by the Ode of Resurrection. That would be pretty cool to see in Natlan's final arc. Before the peaceful conclusion to our current story, we see Il Capitano once more, who refuses to attack Mahuika during her moment of weakness, meaning a mole has also informed the Fatui of her weakened state. Or, again, they have other surprising ways to obtain information. Capitano talks to a figure who stands off-screen, praising him for his useful little trick, who mentions that as long as the sun remains, the day cannot turn into night. So here begins my theory about what will unfold. This figure must be part of the Nightwind tribe, as it is what allowed Capitano's exit. I suspect this individual to be Ororon, just as we see him standing briefly next to Capitano in the first Natlan trailer. Ororon, who bears an ancient name, with its memories fully unlocked, has bargained a deal with the Fatui to extinguish the sacred flame, as he mentions a desire to turn the day into night. Referring to the sacred flame as a sun, Mahuika refused to extinguish when she had the opportunity to. Capitano came to learn of the 500 years plan through this manner, directly informed by Ororon. As to why he would decide to take this matter into his own hands, I can only assume that, as the blood-stained knight, his wish to bring Natlan's sacred flame down, giving an entry point for the abyss to surge plenty through the land, and giving them a way to largely oppose the gods he despises so much as they go against his definition of justice. Part of this meets with the plotline of the Dark Souls game. As this is not a Dark Souls lore video, I will not expand much on it, but I still wish to explain its similarities. In its setting, your purpose is to grossly summarize, fuel a fire in order to extend the Age of Fire forever instead of allowing the natural cycle of an age of darkness, follow after the age of fire and repeat this cycle. You have the option to extinguish the fire and begin the age of darkness, giving humans their rightful place back in the world. To conclude my theory on this cross-universe segment, there is a lot of mirroring to this, as the Abyss is also former Canrians, regular humans, who were warped by its darkness. In Dark Souls, the humans are naturally attuned to the darkness, thus the name Dark Souls. And, finally, those little details meet further down the line, as both the games wish to see this natural flame extinguished to make place for a new age of darkness. In the end, this is only a theory, a game theory of course. Genshin has time and again caught me off guard with predictions and theories being the opposite of what I had personally expected. So, only time will tell what is truly about to unveil in this nation. I hope this has been entertaining for you to watch, and of course feel free to share with me anything you have in mind regarding my theories or yours. 
It's always great to extend your perception of things, I believe. If you like those types of videos, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel. That will be greatly appreciated. In any case, thanks a lot for watching and have fun with your exploration of Nutland.